stuff? Yeah, I know. I won. It's, it's sad, right? So I hope next year you guys build more crappy robots to beat my crappy robot. That's the, uh, crappier robots. Or crappier robots to lose to my crappy robot. That's fine with me, too. Uh, otherwise, uh, outside, this is the last call for t-shirts at the registration table. So if you want a t-shirt, head out there before we start packing them up. Uh, same goes for the hacker stickers vendor booth and the media archives video table. So if you want any talk, it's $5. If you want the whole conference, it's $40. And they have it all on DVD outside. Um, after this talk, we're going to have closing ceremonies in this room. Pretty much as soon as he's done, I'm going to throw him off stage, followed by the laptop. And then we're going to run through that real quick, because they want us out of here by 5.30 at the latest. And then after that, you're all welcome to join us at the 23B after party. Uh, if you need the address, go to shop.23b.org. And, uh, and we'll see you there. Until then, we have stealth with, excuse me, the death of privacy. All I got to do is get this hooked up here. Uh, just a moment to get the technical aspects of the picture on the screen. We'll be right with you. Talk of layer one this year. <sighs> Hopefully it's worth the wait. So, all right. Well, let's see. Uh, a little bit about me. I am uh, spent most of my life fiddling with computers and taking shit apart to see how they worked. And uh, But more recently, I do um, information security work. Uh, I do a lot of special investigations into um, financial crimes, fraud, intellectual property, theft, all that fun stuff. And uh, along the way, I've gotten a few ideas. I wanted to do this talk because uh, privacy is really an issue. And, uh, and I believe that, uh, well, it's not getting any better. And certainly a lot of the talks this weekend have talked about that. So how did it get this bad? And what can you do to get some of, your some of yours back? So here we go. Let's start with the definition. So can you see me down here? Yeah, that's work. All right, so for the purpose of this talk, Privacy is the personally identifiable information, private thoughts, beliefs, and intimate details of our lives, which we share, which we wish to control both how and with whom they are shared. So that should set the tone for where things are going. So in this country, in, in America, from, you know, for, even before the United States, uh, what was it? The pilgrims came here, and it wasn't just to have turkey dinner with the Indians. It was uh, because they were escaping religious persecution. They wanted their rights to self-determination. Okay. Years went on, we started to form a country and write the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, all that stuff. But most people don't realize that privacy is not specifically guaranteed by the Constitution. Shock. Uh, the Bill of Rights, however, the first 10 amendments in the Constitution of the Bill are known as the Bill of Rights collectively. And that's where we really get these rights for, for uh, privacy, the right to uh, not, no illegal search and seizure, uh, right to arm bears, uh, <laughs> the important stuff, okay? So, but obviously things have happened in recent years. The sh shit's gone down and things have been changed. People react, people get scared, they do things that maybe they wouldn't otherwise do. And that's changed the whole landscape. You know, we're talking 9-11 and forward. In fact, I remember a conversation with a TSA agent who said, the expectations of privacy have changed substantially since 9-11. I'm thinking, well, not for me. I still think we deserve privacy. But not everyone uh, has the same picture of what that might be. So you have to kind of measure the needs and with our rights. So, so we don't make too many mistakes here. Let's talk about a lot of the laws have been put into place because of these events, and that's part of what we're dealing with. Okay, so. There are what I would call legal threats to privacy. Uh, Patriot Act and extensions to the Act, in fact, that's up this weekend. They're trying to re-extend that without reading it too quickly. National security letters, you, always, you all know about those. If you get one, you have to do it, but you can't tell anyone. Doesn't seem too right. Uh, postal covers, here's a good one. Do you know the post office photographs your mail and packages on the front and the back? And this was started because of the anthrax scare you know, sending powder poison through the mail, and they figured we need to be able to track this. So they put this plan into place. Well, the anthrax there has kind of gone away, but it's still there. 
So there's a lot of things that seem to have a life beyond their need, okay? And uh, Stingray, big data, these are all things that can affect our privacy in, in different ways. How about the not-so-legal threats? Because that's out there, too. Um, you've all heard about possibly the RSA deal where um, they sold a back door to their encryption. Priceless. Ten million. I'm sure they've made their money back. Uh, you've got organizations that sell zero day to the highest bidder or anybody that's got the money. Fraud schemes, nation-state funded, um, just cyber criminal organizations, a lot of bad things out there. And we've talked about some of those here, um, you know, during this week. So what about the legal issues trending? There's also things going on trying to fight these. Uh, Microsoft is currently in a battle in Ireland trying to get access to a server there that has data on it that uh, pertains to a, a U.S. citizen. And the fight is that if they're allowed to go there and get that from another country, and what's to stop the other country from saying, well, we've got some citizens that you've got their data and we need to get access to that as well. So it's kind of a slippery slope on a lot of these things. Uh, the UK just got uh, granted immunity for doing things that we would find distasteful. Although Europe has generally better privacy laws than we do, there are still things that are not perfect. And there's certainly countries requiring their vendors or you know, uh, service providers to provide back doors into things so that they can spy on their citizens and do other things to protect themselves from themselves or something. So uh, NSA math data gathering, we've, we've you know, certainly heard a lot about that. Australia just joined into the Patriot Act idea. They just passed recently in the past couple of weeks their own version of that. So they'll be having their own set of problems there as a result. Okay. So what do you need to do here? Well, you need to know who your adversary is. You need to be able to determine your value to them. What do you have that they want? Okay. How do you protect that? What's it cost? What's it cost if you don't protect it? Okay. And so in thinking about this, what have I got here? In thinking about this, I'm trying to put together a plan. Now, the idea behind this talk is, is not to solve all the problems in the world, but to create a plan of actionable items that you guys can follow or the people that you're interested in protecting can follow and to be in a better position than you were today, okay? We can't solve all the problems, but we're going to kind of go for the ones that we can make a difference on, okay? So you want to have a, uh, you want to have a list of your assets. You want to know what your tangible assets are as well as your intangible assets. So these may include things that you have or things that you have control of or things that you control or have access for others, like maybe your job. You have certain assets there that you are responsible for, and it may be possible that someone trying to get to those is going to try to get through you to get to that. Okay? Social engineering is, uh, is the new attack. I mean, it's not really a new attack, but it's become more and more useful in the types of blended attacks that we see today going after corporations and individuals. Okay. So what's a hacked PC worth? Well, there's so many things that I can do with it. Let me count the ways. This is not an exhaustive list, but I think it illustrates the idea that there are many opportunities. If they control your PC, they can do many, many bad things. Okay. And a lot of the talks here, we talk about how to protect that, or we talk about here's a new zero day or what have you. But the point here is that you have a lot of potential attack vectors to take care of. So how do you do that? This, this seems like almost an insurmountable problem in some cases. Well, one thing you got to know where the risks are coming from, okay? Cameras, cyber criminal gangs, professional fraudsters, social networks, there's some risk there. Um, infected media, we've all heard the stories. They leave a thumb drive out somewhere hoping some employee will take it and plug it into the corporate network. Um, big data. And, of course, if that's not enough, we also have the new threat, the Internet of Things. Internet of Things. Internet of Things means security was an afterthought. Basically, if I can connect to it, I own it. Uh, this has a lot of implications. I think we'll have to ask Chris Rogers about this particular slide. <laughs> anyway, so when these things happen, there's a cost to it. So it's not just the loss. It's the how do I put myself back and make myself whole again. Okay? And what I've started to look at, I'm trying to apply this to the individual. And my feeling is that Maybe there's some things in the assessment work or the security work that we've done with corporations that run some parallels here. We can, we can get some lessons from that and we can bring this down to the individual level and we can make individuals and the people that we care about protecting uh, a hard target. 
the, the purpose of this is to make you a harder target. Okay? We're hardening the individual. So you need to know what you have of value, who you are, match the assets, match the protection to the level of assets. You need to have backup plans and you need to have methods to recovery. They should be verifiable, they should be tested. You should know they're going to work instead of guess. Okay? So, let me pause for a second here. Okay. I just like this cartoon. That's my idea. All right. So, in looking at some commonalities between corporations and individuals, one of the biggest fears corporations have is uh, workplace violence. The thought that some employee or some individual will have a bad day, get fired, go home, come back with a gun and go postal on the place. Or some kid broke up with his girlfriend, comes back to school and wants to make revenge. Um, individuals have the same thing, getting mugged, get beat up, whatever. Okay, we have physical fears of things that we're concerned about, so that's kind of a parallel there. I'm losing this here. Uh, financial loss, account takeovers is big, damage to the brand, similar to identity theft, intellectual property, that would be our personal information, um, morale impacts on that, internal bad guys, fraud, loss, these are all things that there are parallels to what corporations worry about, but we also worry about. Now, the problem is with the corporation, they have kind of a, you know, let's say they've got a building, they've got security out front, a receptionist, whatever. They've got a somewhat controlled environment to deal with. Whereas individuals, we're, we move around a lot of places. We do a lot of different things. We carry our, you know, we carry our digital devices with us. You know, so we have a lot of different things to consider. How do we manage to do this? Well, I've been thinking about this. I feel it's a complex problem, but as any complex problem, you want to try to break that down into smaller pieces that are more manageable and that those into smaller pieces that you can actionable do something about. And so what I've done is I've come up with a, what I call a framework or a foundation for personal security and risk management. And really when you think about security, it's really all about managing risk. So if we can cut that back and do a better job of that, we're more secure. So that looks like this. These are the cornerstones for the personal risk management. Right? They are data security, identity and reputation, and this would include identity fraud and things of that nature, your financial assets, and of course, physical or layer one. So what do we do here? Okay, let's take them one by one and kind of drill down. And what, I've, what, I've, what I'm proposing is these are things that anybody can do. You may be doing a number of them. You may I may have some different views on a few of them, but it's the type of process that security is not a product, it's a process. And if you or your loved ones or people you want to protect go through this process, you should be better off than when you started. So I want to establish at least a baseline, and that's what this is about. So let's talk about data security. You've got a computer. It's got stuff on it you don't want to lose. What's the one thing, what's the most important thing you could do to make sure that doesn't happen? This is the audience participation time. Raise your hand. Yeah. Backup, I am dealing with an intelligent group here. Great, that's right. Backup procedures are very important. Even if you're not connected to the internet, if it's in a closet somewhere, back it up, you can save it, okay? But there's other things we need to be concerned about. Malware, networks, browsers and other network aware applications, and a thing I call a password or account security audit. And we'll get into this in more detail as we go on. But let's just look at, let's start with each one and, and see if we've got a few insights here. Okay, back up to an external hard drive. This should be obvious, right? Okay, the hard drive should not be kept next to the computer. It should be later stored somewhere away because the two biggest disasters are typically floods and fire. And if it, and if it burns up or the firemen come in and they hose the place down and you waste your backup, you got a problem. So that should be separate. Most of us already know that, okay? There's another thing that I think is important and this is gonna come into play for the recovery portion. Make a mirror image of the system. And by that I mean you want the virgin image of when the OS was put together, you put the applications on it, you know, none of your, none of your personal user data, but a basic running system ready to go with the things that you need. And you should have a mirror image of that so that if, if you need to replace the one you have, you can pull this one out, plug that one in, and you're going to be back up and running, okay? You can restore those documents and you can, you can deal with a catastrophic event to cloud or not to cloud. There's a lot of debate about this. There's public clouds, there's private clouds, there's hybrid clouds, there's cumulus nimbus clouds, you know, it's a cloud thing. But 
uh, I believe that the world is moving to a cloud. Windows 10 is the last Windows released. After that, it's going to be Windows Cloud. Okay, so we can't avoid it. And certainly, you can find a cloud that you like and a cloud that you can put some data in. My feeling is that from a day-to-day -day standpoint, people don't like to do backups. So aside from something that might be super secret, super critical that you might have that I don't know what that is, cloud would be a good way to do some daily backup. Now, also, I would suggest that you have a secondary. You do the full backup onto that hard drive, maybe once a week, once a month, whatever works for you. But in between, you put some things into the cloud. So this kind of covers you in a couple things. And remember, security needs to be done in layers. So here, we don't have a single failure point. We're trying to establish some layers to help us recover and protect our data. Oh yeah, archive pictures and videos. I wanted to say something about that. Those usually take up a lot of space and a lot of times, um, you know, maybe it's stuff we're saving for years. It's the kids' baby pictures or some such thing. And you don't need access to it all the time. Maybe cloud is not the right thing. Maybe that you want to put on another hard drive and stash away. As far as hard drives to stash away, uh, well, I like Western Digital black drives. I don't like the green drives. They seem to fail. We do a lot of forensic work, so we burn through a lot of drives. The black works really nice. SSD drives are great for speed, not great for backup. And the reason is this. Um, if we want to recover data from a mechanical drive, we can do that in a clean room. When an SD drive fails, it's gone. So those pictures and things you want to keep for 10 years or whatever, put them on a good old mechanical drive, stash that away, and that's a better solution for that. Okay? So. All right, so malware, antivirus. Everybody's got one. Everybody needs one. Is it the free one? Is it the one I pay for? What is it? I don't know. Um, how do I choose which one? Well, I can't test all the viruses. I can't test a dozen different AV products. But there are people that do that. So I like PC World comes up with a study, and there's a few other people that do that. Every year, they list, here's the top guys. They try a bunch of stuff against it. You know, maybe one's a winner one year, another winner the other year. But I generally look at the top one, two, or three people. And for one reason or another, maybe somebody has better heuristic algorithms to detect things that are not in the virus signatures, but now will be recognized by their behavior. You know, and she can go with one of those and be relatively safe that you're going to solve a lot of those problems. Okay? So here we go. And then there's root kits. And most of these people have root kit scanners. You all are familiar with those. You can run a few kid scanners. Those are typically free, give you a little extra level of security scanning. See that you've taken care of that aspect as well. Try to start with a clean system, but going on, you know, you want to do these checks. Phishing and drive-by downloads. Well, this is, I mean, these are the new attacks, right? Um, when you hear about the social engineering and all that, it's typically, it's either coming through an email, somebody's called you up on the phone, and says, oh, yeah, hey, I'm a nice guy. I need you to do something for me. And go to this page. Boom, drive by download, you're owned. Okay, you don't have to click on attachments, you don't have to do any of that stuff. So you want to be a little bit aware of those things. And um, there are some tools that we'll talk about later that you can actually test attachments or other things or other sites before you go there to see if there's a problem. Okay? So we're gonna create some layers there as well. Why is my button? Oh, patch management. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, how many of you have done network administration? Show of hands here. Quite a few. Okay, well then you know that patch managing is the blessing and the bane of network administration. Because there's always something new to patch and you gotta do it before you get hosed. Okay? As an individual, however, what do we do? I don't have a I don't have a department of people that are managing patches for me on my Windows box or whatever I've got at home. Well Windows has Windows Update, but they only care about Windows. So what about all the other stuff I'm using? All right? Well, there's a couple tools that I found that you can use. One is by a company called Secunia. It's called Personal Software Inspector. I've been using this for a while. It's pretty good stuff. What they do is it installs on there. It looks at all your installed software. It goes against their database, finds out if you've got the latest version, and in the background, it will download and install the upgrade for you, managing those patches. If you have a Mac, there's a thing called App Fresh that does a similar thing. Now, Secunia has done some tests, and they found that in their way of, uh, in, in their management of these things, they've seen that about 87% of the exploits that get, become public have patches available the day of their release. So if you're using that software, that takes care of a lot of that. Not 100%, but most things get patched relatively quickly, even if they're not available on the first day. And when that happens, 
these software programs will automatically update and keep your system up to date. So here's kind of a mindless way that you can set somebody up that has some additional layers of protection on there, okay? So those are a couple of good tools. Uh, data security firewalls, yes, you need one. They're all built in. You gotta use one even if you don't use a third party one. Change the default passwords, obvious stuff, right? We've, we've, we all know that. Uh, use encryption on Wi-Fi, good idea. But how about, if you really wanna be paranoid, you can turn off the broadcast, you can hide the fact that you've got it there, then you're, if they don't know you're there, how can they attack you? So it makes you a smaller target, makes you a harder target to get it. These things are simple to do, but not everybody does them, so here's some ideas for you and your uh, loved ones. Okay, how about browsers? Well, I don't care what browser you use, they've all got vulnerabilities from time to time. So what we wanna do is keep those patches up. Uh, Java, Flash, everybody knows those are big, uh, those are big inroads into finding the, ne finding the next exploit. Um, there are some browser helpers called HTTPS Everywhere, which is, uh, you can find that on the EFF.org site. And uh, No Script Security Suite, these are two good ones that'll add another level of protection to your online browser, okay? Now, I mentioned that I had a couple tools for you. Uh, these little gems here are kind of cool. Uh, they do a variety of things. If you get an attachment from someone, you think you know who they are, but you're not sure why you're sending that, and I don't know if I want to open it right away, you can upload that to, you know, to one of these sites, and that will test that for you. If you have a link that they say, go here, you can upload that link, and it will sandbox that, run through, find out how many, tell, it'll come back with a report in a few minutes, tell you how many redirects there are, what exploits were there, what else is happening, if it's good to go, or no, you don't want to go there. So, a couple handy little things here that you know, add to your toolkit, gives you that extra layer of protection. If, if, you know, if it slips through these first layers of defenses, you're still not sure, you can run some other tests on it, get a second or a third opinion, and uh, you have a greater degree of safety and security here. Okay? Uh, VMware, everybody's talked about that. It's great if you really need to isolate something. Not everyone needs it, but it's a great tool if you do, if you are traveling the dark web or going to risky places and doing certain things. Maybe you want to isolate that onto a VM machine. Just saying. VPN, if you travel, you should obviously have one. There's a number of them out there that can be useful. I'll let you Google that one. And cell phone risks. Okay, cell phone risks. People talk about the bring your own device and all those things going on as being risked. I think the cell phone risk, the biggest risk is a cell phone is losing it because it can, it's, it's much more than a dialing machine now. It's a computer in your pocket. It has access to all kinds of things. And if you don't put a password on it and you leave yourself logged into your email and I get a hold of that, I can reset all your other passwords on your banking accounts and everything. I mean, these are obvious things, right? Am I telling you anything new? No, but people don't always think about it. So systematically, these are some things that we can go through and make sure that at least we've got all the boxes checked, okay? Well, let's talk about passwords, okay? Now, the, uh, my idea for an account and password audit is this. Surveys have shown that, the, that most people may have between 50 and 75 different accounts that they have passwords for. Some have more, some have less, but you probably find yourself somewhere in that realm. Now, it's obviously difficult to remember 75 different passwords, especially if they're gonna be any good. So, in this self-assessment process, just like we'd be assessing a company, in the self-assessment process, I feel it's relevant to go through and make a list of all the accounts that you have. Go through the old email. You get some things that say, hey, you haven't been here for a while. Oh yeah, maybe I don't need that anymore. Make a list, write down all the accounts that you have, write down all the passwords that you have, and see if some of those you still need. You want strong passwords and Obviously, on the financial sites, you want better passwords than maybe on your LA Times or Wired subscription, which could be something simpler to remember. Um, and remembering them is tough if you have that many, so a password management program can help here. Uh, one in particular comes to mind. It's called Dashlane. And the nice thing about Dashlane is it runs on both platforms. I think, th actually, they may even have a Linux version of it. But it runs on the PC and it runs on the Mac. And the other thing that it has that's interesting is that if you have a breach and you decide, well, I need to reset a bunch of my passwords to keep my account safe, it has a bulk, uh, it has a bulk feature to allow it to go do that. So that will simplify and speed that process for you. Hopefully, you'll never need it, but 
it's nice to know that that's there. Okay. When you're writing down all those passwords and things, you want to store that in a safe place. So remember that fireproof safe where you're putting this extra backup down in the basement or in the garage or somewhere where it's not going to get you know messed up with your computer. That's where you want to put those two. Ziploc baggies are nice because you know if thing gets hosed down, ink smears, I can't read it, whatever. Print that out, put it in a nice Ziploc, stack it in there with, with your backups. That's a good process. Okay. While you're in there looking around, check for account compromises. If you haven't been to some of these accounts for a while and you find, boy, there's a bunch of activity and it's not me, that would be a red flag. You want to know about that. And accounts that you're not using are other avenues for people to impersonate your identity. If you don't need it and you don't use it, shut it down and cancel it. And that's part of the audit. What are we keeping? What are we getting rid of? Are we having strong enough passwords on those? And you know, that's all part of the fun. Let's see. Have a recovery plan. So we're talking about different ways to recover. Having those passwords either in a management system or written down is going to help you do that. Okay. So and don't use your puppy's name as your. Okay. okay. Now, we all like sharing. But certainly some of us have some secrets that maybe we don't want to get out. Okay, so we need to consider some of those things as well. Okay, and so that brings me into our second, uh, second cornerstone here on identity and reputation. And here we're going to talk about social networks, um, the impacts that they can have. Um, okay, here we go. A number, of things, a number of things that impact your identity as well as your reputation. And that's what people think of you on, offline as well as online. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. Social networks, we love them, okay? There was, a time, there was a time that they weren't here, but many of us can't remember that because they're so ubiquitous. And, uh, you know, it's a selfie generation. I need to take a picture here of all of us that I'm going to use or something, but um, selfie sticks were the hottest toy or gift this Christmas, and this thing is becoming ubiquitous everywhere, obviously. We also tend to not read EULAs. We also tend to give up other people's data to, you know, pay flippy, play flippy birds or crush some candy or, you know, what other time killer that we need to waste our time on. Um, yeah, I care, not, I care about my privacy, but not so much about yours because I'm willing to give all my friends email addresses to the uh, app vendor to, uh, just for a chance to level up. Um, tracking in big data, that's uh, obviously a lot of this stuff goes into those marketing systems and inference attacks and other types of things. Well, marketing doesn't call it inference attacks. Hackers would call it inference attacks. But they're just collecting data to know more about you. Okay? Uh, in the Pentagon, a number of intelligence agencies, they are now talking about uh, open source intelligence. Open source intelligence means I don't have to have spies. I don't have to have spies in the field necessarily. Well, I do. But most of you share so much that I can get it for free. Okay? So you need to be careful with a little bit of that. Okay, employers, if you're looking for a job, there are, I've come across uh, systems marketed to HR people that do massive investigations across all the social network and they find out all kinds of stuff about you. So, you know, maybe those, maybe recent pictures of that wild party in Mexico last weekend aren't good to put up right away. Just saying. So, what else we got? Multimedia. Well, we, we, we all have cameras. Our phones are cameras. It used to be a separate device. Now it's with everyone. Okay, so Andy Warhol said that everyone will have their 15 minutes of fame. Yes, you will, maybe more than that, because as memories fade, internet posts live on forever. So careful, and, and you can't always be sure if you're the one taking the picture, if somebody else is taking the picture or the video of you. Um, and then this brings me to trial by social media. We've all seen recently a number of examples in the press of individuals who found themselves or their conversations filmed and shared when they were supposed to be private or they didn't know it was happening. And the problem with that is not to say that individuals didn't do bad things that should have been disclosed, but just as often probably are people doing things that maybe are being taken out of context. But once it goes viral, everyone judges it on the soundbite. And, uh, you know, it's, it's cost people their jobs. Uh, it's also been dangerous for people traveling if you're in a country that's uh, not as democratic as ours. People have been arrested for tweeting the wrong thing at the wrong time. So we need to be aware and careful of those things as we're traveling as well as just our day to day. Okay, so in summary, be careful what you share. And here's some other things you can do. Now, proactive side. 
If other people are investigating you, if we're all paranoid and we think they're out to get us, well, if you're paranoid, it doesn't mean they're not out to get you. But one thing you should try to do is find out what can they know about you. Well, a good way to do that is Google yourself. You can use that to find out what other people know. In fact, Google's got an interesting service that I use where you can put a search term or a few search terms in there, and if those items come up with some new information, like I use my name, it emails me and says, oh, by the way, there's something new out there about you. That's kind of a good way to keep track of your own identity and uh, fame in the world, so to speak. Um, you should get an annual credit report. We're talking about, you know, all these things are going to affect your reputation, your business to do uh, a biz blah, blah, blah. your ability to do business at some point. Uh, annualcreditreport.com is the place to get the free one, not free credit report. That's the one that signs you up for the service for the free one they're going to give you. So these guys are good. Is an alternative? No, annual credit report is the good one. That's the free one. The free credit report dot com is the the sales pitch. They apparently had some bad information about me that prevented me from being able to prove who I was to ask for the report. So well, have you been a victim of identity fraud as such? Not that I know of. Well, that's why you're wanting to check those things out. See, this is where this starts to show up. Get the report and check it you out. can contact the uh, you can contact TransUnion or any of the credit bureaus directly and have a way to identify yourself and they may have to go back and forth with you on some on some other channel but you will be able to do it in that fashion so okay, okay. that's all i can say for that um credit watch and fraud alerts uh, if you've heard about these there if you have been victimized credit watch can stop people from opening up things fraud alert is kind of the more severe one uh, if you have fraud alert you can't get another credit card you can't mortgage a house until you take it off so if you've really been under the gun and they've been ass raping you with uh, identity fraud that's your only protection left but it's a little bit severe and you have to renew it about every six months question in the front credit yeah credit freezes if you use these services like lifelock they do similar things like that yes yeah, so you can do it yourself also yeah but you know time is money so depending on which one you, you may want to spend the the ten dollars a month with a credit service that does that and you want one that does it in real time, not that tells you a month later, oh, by the way, you got screwed, okay? So um, LifeLock's the big name out there, and, and I think the guy was in data. He's the one that used to post his social security number on Billboard and say, I'm so safe. And he was scammed so many different ways because of that. But despite his ignorance, the service is rather decent and it's comprehensive. So if you want somebody to compare others with, look at that and look at the others and decide for yourself. Uh, EIN number. Um, Anybody in here, uh, independent consultant work? Show of hands, anybody? Okay, uh, any of you use EIN numbers? All right, for those of you that don't know what it is, uh, I don't like sharing my social with everybody or anybody really. Uh, employee identification number you can get, it's free, you fill out a form at the IRS, you get the thing, and now on that W-9 form that you send to the employer of who you are, you use the EIN number because, you know, I don't know, why they're, I don't know how they're storing that information, I'm not about to give them my social, so that lowers your exposure there. And in all these things, you want to make copies of your stuff. Oh, I forgot to mention Facebook is something that you can download your entire history from Facebook to see what you've really been doing. Sometimes that's interesting in doing your self-investigation. And another site here, PIPL.com, is a popular one for doing searches for you across social networks and other media and other placements. So here's a couple of places that in a very short period of time, you can get a, you can get a fairly decent idea on, you know, hey, what's out there on me? Okay, are there things out there that I don't want to be or... Now that they're out there, I need to take some reaction to that. So a couple of things you can do there. All right, well, we've all become, if you're, if you're starting a business or a website, we've all become whores for Google, where it's all about you know, pimping for Google for ad clicks and eyeballs. Uh, and yet at the same time, there are some you know, positive things there, but um, we don't always wanna be sharing everything. And sometimes there's a need to do something more private. So, how not to be seen. Um, you can use anonymous search engines if you're concerned about tracking and cookies and things, okay? Uh, you can create alternate identities. Um, this is not in any particular order, but uh, I can tell you from doing a lot of business employee investigative type of things for bad shit going on in the company, don't do that stuff at work. <laughs> you're just, it's like stupid criminals. They, if you look at it, you're going to catch them. It's dumb, don't do it. 
That's, that's all I can say on that. Okay. Uh, temporary email accounts. Sometimes you're trying to do something and you want your email to send you a link to a whatever. Um, 10 minute email. That's a great site. You get an email account, use that, you get the link back. It self destructs in 10 minutes. Okay. Nice, simple, nice, simple solution. There's others out there. That's one I've used personally and think it works pretty well. Use encryption. PGP is one I now. We're all worried about the NSA being able to break encryption and have backdoors and own the SIM company and this and that. Um, PGP seems to be one they're still having trouble with. So if you've got to pick something, that's, you know, that's a reasonable one, and, and it's popular enough. It's been around a long time. Phil Zimmerman wrote that a long time ago to deal with, to help countries, uh, to help individual dissidents in different countries, and it's been a pretty solid product ever since. So the Onion Router, uh, there's a tax on the Onion Router. I don't know if you guys heard about the timing attacks, where if you control a certain number of the, in, the, uh, the entry nodes and the exit nodes, which in the United States, about 58% of them are controlled potentially by government entities or someone related to that. In China, it's about 88%. So depending on where you are, neither situation is very good. Uh, there's a recreation of that project called Astoria that's, that's coming out now, that's, that's starting to gain some traction. And this is going to try to fix that problem. So something to keep abreast of if you are a Tor type person. Other tricks and techniques. Well, if you're really paranoid, you can get the black phone from Silent Circle. You can use Wicker as a texting and uh, as a texting solution. There are other anonymous communication methods as well. And something I discovered recently that I thought was kind of fun was an application called Flash Chat. Now, here's the deal with Flash Chat and why I think it was kind of fun. If you, uh, Flash Chat allows anybody that's connected to the same wireless router to be connected together and communicate. So let's say that you had some civil rights issues that you were demonstrating and you need to coordinate with your people and what have you. And you had a small portable uh, open source router like this one is. You could set that up and be somewhere with a backpack and communicate to your other team members uh, to connect to this thing. You meet, in, meet at the park at noon and we can all talk and you can preserve anonymity and yet create communications and coordinations and all sorts of other interesting things. So just kind of throw that out there. So. All right, so that brings us to the end of our second phase, which was identity and reputation. Now what I want to do is talk about, it's all about the money, because that's what you have that they want, okay? So whether it's phishing attacks or some other attack going on, you need to be able to protect the money that you have. Okay, so we're going to talk about a couple things that you can do that are simple, straightforward, and that'll increase your hardness against that attack. All right. So where are we exposed here? Uh, banking, banking investments, okay, 401k, whatever you've got online there. Online shopping, and my favorite scam, swindles and cons. Okay. So we're going to cover we're going to cover each one of these. So with banking. You obviously want to protect access to your account. So everybody's got the secret PIN number. Everybody's got the super duper password for their online access. And you know now that there are skimmers that in certain areas, when you put that card in, the bad guy is getting its impression. Now, a lot of these things aren't made too well. So what I always do is kind of pull on the thing and see if it's a good one or not. Um, that works at an ATM machine. Sometimes they're fake. Sometimes in the little card thing there, they got a camera that's looking at you typing your pin. So what you want to do is you want to put your hand or something over your pin just to be sure. Okay. Uh, they have some algorithms that if they see your knuckles and fingers moving, they can figure out which thing. So, so cover it good enough and do your pin that way. That'll limit your exposure just that much more. Okay. Um, the other thing about credit cards and ATMs, with, um, also with gas pumps, uh, there have been a lot of scams with the gas pumps now stealing skimmers. So I never use a credit card at a gas pump anymore. The first ones were discovered a couple years ago in Malibu, and uh, there's a whole organized crime rig that runs around stealing gas and stealing credit cards. They now have um, wireless units in those things, so they just have to drive by and to get the dumps down and continue on. So that would be bad. So I kind of use cash there. That's my way of doing it. You may feel differently. ATM cards. I never use an ATM card except at my bank. And the reason is this. Even though it says it's a Visa, it's a MasterCard, or what have you, 
It doesn't have the same element of protection as a credit card does. If you get a bad charge on a credit card, you call them up and you go, hey, that wasn't me. They go, oh, thank you very much for calling, sir. We'll take it off your bill and investigate. Boom, done. Somebody gets your, somebody gets your ATM, goes to the bank, drains your account. You call the bank and go, hey, somebody took all of my money. And they go, wow, I'm sorry to hear that, but now you're overdrawn. Do you have any more money? So they don't have the same level of protection there. I don't think you should use ATM, ATM cards for getting anything except out of your ATM, and you know it's secure, and that's it. The rest of it, never use it online. That would be bad, in my estimation. So these things aren't absolute, but they will. each one will lower your risk exposure a little bit. And then stolen checks. You know, people still use checks in this era of online payments and auto pays and all that. Yes, there's still some old school checks floating around, or you might receive some. Well, one of the things that used to be an exploit against checks is called check washing. Anybody heard of that? Okay, we've got a few people. Check washing is basically, if you haven't heard, they take your check, which they stole out of your mailbox or what have you, and they use a solvent. They take the check with the signature side up, and they dip that in there, and it dissolves the part that you wrote, but they keep your signature. And then they refill in their name any appropriate amount and cash that check. Okay, so how do you defend against that? Well, it costs $2 to defend against that. For $2, you go out and you buy a pen. It looks like it's a ballpoint pen, just like any other. But, it's, but it's not, it's the ink is called, it's a gel pen. And a gel pen ink has a different, it's not a pigment ink, but it has particles in it that embed themselves in the paper. So when they try to wash it, it leaves artifacts. It doesn't wash. It does not work. That stops them from check washing. So I write all my checks with gel pens now, and so should you. Two bucks, they're available staples, any place you can find them everywhere. Just look for the one that says gel pen on it. Okay, so buying stuff online. Well, there's a lot of fraud online, and Amazon, eBay, and Craigslist. Amazon does a fairly decent job, but they still have a lot. eBay, there's a lot of fraud on eBay. And Craigslist, shit, anybody can be on Craigslist. So. Um, we've all seen ads where they're going to send you a check for greater than the amount and you send them the car, stupid things like that. Nobody here is going to fall for any of those, but some people do, oddly enough. And also your physical security. When you're meeting somebody on Craigslist, you want to do it in the daylight. If there's money involved that's of any substance, bring a friend. You know, meet in the daytime, meet in a public place. A lot of things you see on Craigslist, on eBay and Amazon, they have ratings, but you want to look at the ratings to see if it's not being pumped up by someone else. You know, are these ratings new when they've all come in in the same, you know, few weeks by people that say, oh, there's wonderful, no complaints. Okay, so be careful about trusting some of that because there's no real good verification system on those. We see the same thing on Yelp. I've been involved in a couple cases recently that have been identity damage kind of things where a business has felt that someone or some competitor was putting bad shit up about them on, on uh, Yelp. And, uh, you know, so, but that can go both ways. If people putting stuff up on Yelp, You've, you go into a store and you go, like us on Yelp and get 10% off. Well, I don't really care about you, but I want to buy this at 10% off. So, yeah, they're great. Okay, trust but verify here. Okay, be a little bit suspicious. Be a little cautious. Transaction security. Well, we can use credit cards to do that. But at the same time, if we're dealing with companies that we're not so sure of, then you might want to put a buffer between you and your credit card. And one way to do that is to use a service like PayPal. It does cost you a percentage. However, uh, security costs something, and there might be opportunities or incidents where that makes a good idea for you. In addition to that, if you're buying things from other risky sites, shall we say, you might want to use prepaid credit cards rather than your credit card. Prepaid credit cards don't have your name on them. But they're good for a Visa, MasterCard, and American Express. You can usually get them up to $500 or so, and um, they can come in handy in certain situations. Silk Road, it's all Bitcoins. But even the Bitcoin people nowadays, because the fluctuation of Bitcoins has been so radical, we're finding that they're quickly converting their Bitcoins into cash or other currency. So it's, it's really becoming a transitory um, monetary medium rather than something to, to hold for investment purposes. But, but I digress. So... Okay, frauds and scams. This is the fun stuff. Uh, telemarketing scams still happen. Uh, things happen in the mail. I got something in the mail the other day that said, here, confirm your listing in the, uh, in the national yellow pages or something. And it looked like, oh, okay, I get these all the time for my business. Yes, 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 that's me. Fine, send it in. About a month later, I got a bill 
that showed that video showed that on there and they were expecting me to pay like four hundred dollars for the listing I'm like, wait a second, you know, I call these people up, they go, oh, no, it's not really a bill. So if you're stupid enough to not read the fine print and send them the money, and a lot of companies, they'll get these things, and it'll just go through the system. So kind of have to be careful there. Um, whenever there's a disaster, fake charities and stuff get put up there for, for scams. You need to have people watch for that. You know, Red Cross, there's some, there's some big names that you can trust. Is that 20 or 30? That is 10. We're going to move along faster right now. Okay. So Spanish prisoner is a type of advanced fee fraud. You don't want them to ask for money up front before they deliver it. That would be bad. Work at home, forward shipments, those are all related to that. And the grandma schedule, the grandma swindle where somebody calls up, pretends to be a relative, and send us money to get your kid out of jail in Mexico. Okay? Don't be like this guy. You've got to think before you act here. Okay? That's the main message here. And there's, okay, we'll move through this quickly. They want you to react quickly. They want you to not think. They want you to keep it you know, to yourself. The red flags are you get offered an unusual high rate of return. Okay, Double your money. There's very few, if any, legitimate investments where you can do that. Guaranteed. They aren't guaranteed. It's hard to find any information about this opportunity, company, or individuals. That should be a red flag. You've got to act now. You can't think about it. It's happening now. Don't, you snooze, you lose. You want to be there, don't you? You want to be one of the winners. You want to be one of the successful ones. And you'll find yourself in a room with a bunch of people and they're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And half of them are involved in the scam. Try not to fall for that. And the need to keep it a secret. Don't tell anyone because it's a special thing. And you, this special person, it's just for you. Okay? So be prepared beforehand. Okay? You want to be, it's always be prepared before something happens. A lot of, doesn't this remind you of Petty a little bit? I don't know. But is he in the room? <laughs> no. Okay. So you want to be prepared beforehand. So on the physical side, you've got some risk there. Come on, work, work, work. Here we go. Lots of things. That's you. You're real life. You've got real things you need to be concerned with. So what do we do? Well, here's an idea. Go outside and look around. If, if you're worried about being robbed or something, or what the security's like, go outside your house at night. Walk around. What can you tell from across the street? What can you see inside? What's the exposure from you or your neighbors or what have you? This may be enlightening if you've only seen it from the inside and never thought about this. Different perspectives here are helpful because the guys going after you are going to be outside and what they can learn is what they know. Make a plan on what to do, discuss it with your plan, discuss it with your friends and work that out. Okay? Um, think through the different scenarios, disasters that you might encounter, whether it's earthquake or floods or tornadoes or what have you, and have a plan beforehand on what you want to do. It's much better than trying to come up with it at the moment. A jump bag or skate plan. Um, Petty did a talk a couple of years ago uh, where he t had a lot of great ideas about jump bag and escape plan. It's in the archive somewhere. I would recommend you check that out. And here's the last thing. First aid and Red Cross. Okay? When you're in a disaster, you might be the first one on the scene. There's a number of people in, in our group. I know Arclight, who was just speaking, Petty, and a number of people are EMTs and have done this training. This is your chance to really potentially save a life. And if we're talking about mad skills, this is kind of one of the neatest hacks you can know. So I suggest you all take the class. It's six hours. It costs about 110 bucks. They offer it every week somewhere. And you could be a hero someday. You could, you could make a big difference. Okay? So with that, we've kind of covered the, the, physical, the data security, the identity and reputation, the financial, and some things about physical security. And I think that breaking things down into these different cornerstones allows you to put some better management and better security into place to do that. So with that, uh, I want to just touch on the beginning, which was the death of privacy. Everybody says it's hard to fight City Hall, and as an individual it may be. But there are some organizations out there that are gathering together their resources that are doing that, and they're worthy of checking out. Uh, the EFF is one of them for the Electronic Frontier Foundation the American Civil Liberties Association, and certainly conferences like, the, like Layer 1 and others allow you to keep up to date and abreast at the latest things of what's happening and what you need to do for that. So, uh, and don't forget to vote, because you get the government you deserve. With that, some final thoughts. You're responsible. You need to take this into your consideration. You need to take the uh, bull by the horns, as they say. You need to become more aware of the world around you, which will make you better prepared to meet the challenges against your data, your identity, your money, yourself, and your loved ones, both in real life and online. Thank you very much for listening.
And I'm gonna get, I'll get some notes up on this in a couple of days after the weekend. Um, you can, if you need to contact me, you can find me there. And I've got a secret project in the works. If you want to check that out a little later, just follow that, and you may be the first to know. Thank you very much.